Here's just a little bit about me. I, my area of research focus is scarring alopecia. I've authored two books on hair loss as well and have been fortunate to have my research funded um, by the Dermatology Foundation, Skin of Color Society um, as well. So the first hair loss that I'm gonna be talking about is CCCA. This is probably the most common form of hair loss that I see in my clinic, especially because I do so much research in this area. So it is a progressive scarring alopecia that occurs predominantly in black women. Um, very interesting thing about CCCA, unlike other scarring alopecias where you can monitor activity by the level of inflammation, fibrosis is actually the predominant finding and not inflammation. And it's not uncommon to have women with CCCA who never even have overt signs of clinical inflammation or report symptomatic inflammation. And so a couple years ago, um, I did a study where I looked at the gene expression profile in patients with CCCA. And what we found is that there was one gene in particular that encodes for adenosine monophosphate kinase or AMP kinase that was underexpressed in about a third of our samples. And the reason that this became relevant is because AMP kinase has been implicated in another form, um, another uh, uh, clinical process um, termed a fibroproliferative disorder where you see this fibrosis that occurs disproportionately to the level of inflammation. In this case, two fibroproliferative disorders, hepatic fibrosis and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And when you used metformin in mouse models of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it was found to reverse the fibrotic process by upregulating AMP kinase. And so after seeing these results in the literature, um, in my clinic, we began compounding topical metformin and published the results in a case series. And so what you see here, these are two patients who failed standard therapy with CCCA. And I will, I, will, I will say that it's really important to understand that when you see patients with scarring hair loss day in and day out, saying things like there's no chance for hair regrowth, it really becomes very disappointing and frustrating to patients, even though we know that the chances of regrowth are very, very slim. But as Dr. McMichael often says, there is a chance for follicular rescue in the right patient. And so these patients both received topical steroids, intralesional catalog for several years, became just grew tired with intralesional um, with intralesional steroids, um, and then decided to transition to so topical regimen. So in the, both of these patients, we did topical metformin alone. I compounded it in a 10% uh, lipoderm cream and had them apply it once daily. And so we published um, these two patients. Um, a couple of things to note about topical metformin. One, patients do often complain of scalp dryness and irritation. So I always recommend that they follow it with a light oil, which will combat that kind of irritant contact dermatitis. Um, the other thing that I'll say about it is the, in my experience, when I do have patients who see results, they're not necessarily long lasting. So they have to stay with treatment to sustain results, very similar to any other therapy we use like minoxidil. And overall, my success rates are about 10 to 15%, right? So we're kind of, which I think is okay, right? We're going with a condition that has a 0% chance of regrowth when you look at it, you know, in the old school literature and 10 to 15%, can be a game changer. And this picture that you see on the left here, this is a patient that I did not publish. This patient in the picture on the left, she was wearing a wig every day. And on the picture of the right, she's out of the wig. Um, and I really think that on the right, it really, in some ways overestimates how much hair loss she actually has in person. She was really, had really significant improvement with metformin alone. Another form of, of scarring hair loss that I see very often is lichen planopilaris and frontal fibrosing alopecia, which many of us consider just to be a subset of lichen planopilaris. Lichen planopilaris is an inflammatory primary scarring alopecia that currently happens most commonly in women. And so the telltale signs are follicular hyperkeratosis, perifollicular erythema, and of course, loss of follicular ostea, which is characteristic of all forms of scarring alopecia. These patients also often report a loss of body hair as well as hair on the eyebrows. Um, and so standard treatment for these patients, obviously anti-inflammatories. I like to use um, hydroxychloroquine in patients who are premenopausal coupled with a topical steroid or topical steroid sparing agent versus oral finasteride or even dutasteride in my postmenopausal patients 
coupled with topical anti-inflammatory agents, always plus minus ILK. Um, I am less likely to do intralesional steroid injections to my FFA patients because they atrophy quite quickly and more likely to do it in lichen planus pilaris. But what do I do when none of those things are working, right? So a lot of these patients complain about burning and itching. And so um, that can be very, very difficult to control. So for these patients who fail standard therapies and you're still having a difficult time getting those symptoms under control, naltrexone is an option. So naltrexone is currently FDA approved for the treatment of opioid and alcohol dependence. Dr. Shapiro's group uh, published a, a great uh, case study supporting its use. Um, but basically it's hypothesized that naltrexone at low doses can serve as an anti-inflammatory agent and certainly can have some antipyritic activity. And in this case series um, from Dr. Shapiro, they just followed four patients with lichen plano pilaris and um, use of naltrexone at three milligrams a day led to reduction in symptoms. Now you guys should know that it's commercially available only in a 50 milligram tablet. And so to get that low dose, you do have to send that to a compounding pharmacy. But I've had a similar experience as well. About, I would say 20 to 30% of my patients, this can really be a silver bullet for them. Um, and getting that symptom control can be super important for these patients. Another thing that I use also, this was also published by Dr. Shapiro's group at NYU, use of compounded tacrolimus cleanser. So tacrolimus, we're typically using it in a 0.1% preparation. Um, that's, uh, where, that's the preparation that's commonly available, but at higher strengths, you may get increased efficacy. And so in this case series, they compounded 0.3% tacrolimus and Cetaphil cleanser and saw that they were able to get people to stabilization a little bit sooner actually than those who were using super potent topical steroids. Um, and so I like this a lot. There are a couple of things that can make this difficult to use for your patients. One, the Cetaphil cleanser isn't a cleanser that lathers really well, which is good for inflammation, right? The, lather, the cleansers that lather a lot can strip the skin of protectants and moisturizers. So we like the low, the low lather effect, but um, with a very small bottle, I think it's less, it's harder to, for my lichen plano pilaris patients to use because they can run through it very quickly, even in a single wash. I think for all patients, this makes a lot more sense for me, for my FFA patients, because they can almost use it like it's a face wash. And certainly for my black patients, I always recommend that they're going to use it just if they have FFA, um, because again, it's going to be much harder to kind of get that through curly hair, um, and if they have diffuse involvement through lichen planus pilaris. The last part being that the price can be prohibitive. It runs about $120, so you always have to make sure to run that by your patient before you try it. But I've had, I've had good results with this as well. Um, this case, really important to talk about. This is a, a patient who came to me um, in consultation for CCCA, chief complaint, patient with hair loss. This is a young woman in her early 30s. She'd been receiving intralesional steroids um, and doxycycline for three years. No improvement and no improvement being, well, my hair doesn't look any different. Again, even though you as a dermatologist may tell these patients, hey, look, this is a form of hair loss. We're never expecting regrowth. They're still hoping and wishing for regrowth, that's the whole reason that they're allowing you to inject their scalp every day, right? It's, it's not the, the promise of lack of progression. It's really this hope that maybe just maybe they'll get some hair to come back. But when I saw this patient, I actually was not convinced that CCCA was a majority of her problem. And I was really concerned about the dullness and the brittleness of her hair. You can see that she has hairs of varying lengths. She has a lot of buildup. And so I was really concerned about acquired trichorexis nodosa. And I decided, to do no medical treatments at all for this patient and actually just put her on a healthy hair routine. So we did no prescriptions, no topical steroids, no intralesional steroids, just healthy hair. And this was her follow-up appointment. So three years of intralesional steroids for presumed CCCA. And she comes back like this after five months. She certainly still has thinning in the scalp vertex. She might have a small component of CCCA, but certainly 90 to 95% of her problem was hair care, okay? So really keep that in mind that patients will think that you're some miracle worker and you're really just, you know, toying around with their hair care practices. 
So just a little bit of information about a cryotrichorexis trichorexis nodosa. This is just recurrent hair breakage that occurs as a result of damaging hair practices or not enough TLC. So while you can have breakage from chemical relaxers, hair dye, thermal styling, a lot of these patients may not be doing any of those things. They actually may be natural and say they never relax their hair. They never um, thermally style it, but they're, they're not deep conditioning it. They're not moisturizing it. And so this is my sample regimen that I provide to my patients with curly hair that's damaged. I like them to do something like a light protein treatment every week, which can increase the strength of the hair by about 10% between washes. Um, washing the hair once a week, that gives them the opportunity to deep condition every time they wash. And that deep conditioning allows the hair to stay moisturized, which is a big issue in curly hair. Additionally, I like my patients to use a leave-in conditioner about three times a week, preferably glycerin-based, especially if they have very tightly curly hair that's very, very dry. And just like we do the soak and smear technique for eczema, when we see our kids with really dry skin, we say soak in the tub, get out of the tub. We don't even want you to dry off, just slather Vaseline on. It is the same idea with dry hair. Wash your hair. I don't even want you to towel dry it off. Put an, put an emollient, um, a light oil, or even a, a hair grease sometimes um, can do the trick if it's applied in the right way. And that will keep patient's hair moisturized. Um, traction alopecia, I think this is my last form of hair loss. We, got, we are all very familiar with traction alopecia. Certainly we want these patients to avoid extensions, which is likely the cause of this form of hair loss. But what can they do if they're approaching end stage and your you know, topical steroids aren't working, your topical minoxidil is not working, they've been avoiding extensions and they're still disappointed with their outcome. Well, oral minoxidil is something that I think as dermatologists is underutilized in our clinics. This was a, get, a great care, case series by Dr. Beach, looking at the efficacy of oral minoxidil and androgenetic alopecia and traction alopecia. In, the, in this case series, they maxed out at a dose of 1.25 milligrams. I actually maxed out at 2.5 milligrams. But I think the important things to note um, about the, the data presented here is that um, this was generally well tolerated. Only one person reported lightheadedness and dizziness. So certainly counseling about that. Um, but hypertrichosis, you certainly have to counsel patients about it, right? We're counseling them about it if we're using topical minoxidil, certainly if they're taking it by mouth. Um, we do expect some peach fuzz on the face, but for these patients, I say it's easier to remove hair. We know how to remove hair, right? We can wax it, we can shave it, we can do all these things. It's much harder to grow hair. Um, some side effects to consider. So first thing, oral minoxidil is an antihypertensive. The dosing range is between five and 40 milligrams. These are some of the side effects, weight gain, headache, symptoms of low blood pressure, lightheadedness, dizziness, et cetera, tachycardia, palpitations, very, very rarely, again, at this dose range, so not the dose range that we're necessarily using, but at this dose range, um, you can get a Stevens johnsons like reaction. Um, you really should avoid this in patients with a history of congestive heart failure, but no serious side effects have been reported at lower doses. There are a couple ways that you can dose this for your patients. You can start off at a quarter, you can start off at a quarter pill, then go up to a half pill, which is 1.25 milligrams and then work your way up to a full pill of 2.5 milligrams, or you can start off at a half pill. I tend to do this ladder regimen, a half pill for four weeks, and then I work up to a, a full pill. One thing I did not notice note here also, pedal edema is a side effect, and I do see occasionally patients with pedal edema even at the 1.25, but having that kind of long taper upwards, I think, um, can help decrease those side effects. Generally, I avoid it in pregnant women. I, patients with low blood pressure, to me, that means any woman below 30, right? So I'm not using in those patients. I love it in my patients who are in their 50s and 60s who are going to tend a little bit hypertensive anyway, because they're going to have just a, some more resilience. And again, avoiding in those patients with congestive heart failure. And then this, I'm not talking about a form of hair loss here, but I did want to talk about the use of platelet-rich plasma in scarring alopecia. We published a case series a couple years ago, almost a couple of years ago now, where we um, discussed the efficacy of platelet-rich plasma in both lichen planar pilaris and CCCA. A lot of times in my clinic, but certainly in this paper, we're really doing this for patients who already failed standard treatments, right? And again, by failing, I mean, they don't have regrowth and they have scarring hair loss. Some people just consider that standard quo. 
In my clinic though, for my patients, a lot of them consider that failing standard treatments, even though they know chances of regrowth are low. So for the right patients, we can do this. And, and my protocol is I do um, three to four treatments spaced four weeks apart. If they're already on minoxidil, they should stay on it, but I do not initiate minoxidil during PRP just because of that initial shedding phase. Me personally, if I don't see any improvement after two sessions, then I tell patients that they should stop. I really think that after two sessions, we should see a little bit of improvement. If we're getting absolutely nothing, um, then I, I don't see the utility of continuing, but I know that there are people who differ on that. So just a, cute, a couple examples. This is a patient with CCCA. She had been, uh, you know, I had seen her for a few years at this point intralesional steroids, topical steroids, topical minoxidil and oral spironolactone to address a possible androgenetic component still could not get hair growth. We did PRP and she got significant hair growth, but she did not, after she finished her first three treatments, she was very happy with her results, was not able to continue the next year for repeat treatments because you do have to repeat this yearly and was not able to sustain these results. And so she's back to the picture on the left-hand side. This is a patient with CCCA, same story, failed standard therapies. This is her before, and this is her after. This is a patient with lichen planar pilaris, young girl, very difficult to control. My young patients with LPP in some ways to me feel a little bit more difficult to control, failed a lot of treatments. Um, and this was her after platelet rich plasma. She actually, not in this picture, but she later, we started her on oral naltrexone and a compound attack relimus cleanser. She's been doing quite well. This is an, a patient with frontal fibrosing alopecia. I love frontal fibrosing alopecia for PRP. With PRP, this might be my favorite scarring hair loss to treat with PRP. These patients do get a lot of regrowth along the temple. So you can see the before on the left hand and then the after. And that is it. Thank you guys for your attention. Hopefully I wasn't talking too fast. I just did not want to go over and I might have anyway. Crystal, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, great treatment pearls for all of these difficult to treat entities. Thank you. No so problem. our first question is um, from Elizabeth Yim. What type of oil do you typically recommend for these patients? Yeah, so I am going to guess that that patient means um, maybe a light oil after the wash. I could briefly touch on essential oils. Um, patients are always coming in. They always wanna use essential oils. I tell patients essential oils are for the scalp. The type of oils that I'm talking about are actually carrier oils that are a little bit greasy. So I'm referring to olive oil, grapeseed oil, jojoba oil, argan oil. If patients have really fine hair, I like argan oil best. If they have coarser hair, thicker hair, something like an olive oil or grapeseed oil is going to be totally fine. And that's going to be fine to do a few times a week without causing a lot of buildup. Wonderful, thank you. We have time for one more question. Any role for lasers or lights in all of these forms of alopecia, transplantation of scarred skin? Yeah, so great. So I actually think eczema laser um, works quite well, especially for lichen plano pilaris. So I've had some of my LPP patients that when we can't get them controlled with these immunosuppressants or anti-inflammatory medications, that they can respond quite well to eczema laser. For my patients with CCCA, again, inflammation tends not to be that overt or that prominent. And so I don't ever do any laser treatments for them. I am not a big fan at all of hair transplantation in patients with scarring alopecia, even if they're in remission. Um, I've just really seen so many bad outcomes. Some of these patients will do well for the first few months after transplant and eventually lose the hair. Um, so again, even if they're in remission and there's no active inflammation, I, I don't think that they are great candidates for transplants in the long run. Thank you so much, Dr. Agu. We really appreciate it. What a wonderful talk. No, thank you. All right, Maggie, am I up? Can everybody hear me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Flexibility is key in these virtual times. Okay, so next we have Dr. Shadi Karosh. And Shadi is the Director of Community Health and the Director of the Pigmentary Disorder and Multi-Ethnic Skin Clinic in the Department of Dermatology at MassGen and at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Karosh. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Waldman. And I want to first open by congratulating my friend Crystal on an outstanding talk. I always learn a lot and thank you. Um, yes, as, uh, as Dr. Waltman explained, I am the founding director of the, I'm the director of community health and I'm the founding director of the uh, Clinic for Pigmentary Disorders and Multi-Ethnic Skin at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And our presentation today is part of a larger research initiative that we have been conducting in my research group on the intersection of uh, pigmentary disorders with uh, public health and, and its racial implications um, in looking at the safety of skin lightening treatments. And so, um, and, and actually this is part of a, uh, a larger study that we, um, one, of, one part of which we actually published in the International Journal of Women's Dermatology, our own WDS journal, which came out in the September issue. So I encourage everyone to, to take a look at that. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce my star medical student, uh, Samara Pollock, who worked on these initiatives with me, who will be giving the presentation today. Hi, it's great to be here. I actually had pre-recorded the presentation um, as I wasn't sure if I would be able to make it. So it's already um, available with my voice recorded over. ...of the potent corticosteroids escaping regulation and marketed for skin lightening in ethnic beauty supply stores. Skin lightening agents are prescribed by dermatologists for the treatment of melasma and other acquired pigmentary disorders. Active ingredients often include potent topical corticosteroids, hydroquinone, and topical retinoids. Many active ingredients of non-prescription skin lightening products are unknown, as these products bypass regulation, especially when imported from other countries. Mercury, potent steroids, and hydroquinone all have been reported in ingredients. Non-prescription sources of high-potency steroids are often a challenge to dermatologists because of the perceived safety of these products among patients who use them for skin lightening. The purpose of this report is to help characterize the public health concern of easily accessible, harmful, and misleading unregulated lightening products. In this observational study, we collected data on skin lightening products advertised to contain corticosteroids at ethnic beauty supply stores. Ethnic beauty stores are retailers that cater to women with skin phototypes four through six, with origins from Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa that are believed to sell skin lightening products. These stores are most commonly categorized under the name beauty supply on location finding services. Google Maps was used to identify ethnic beauty supply stores within a 15 mile distance of our ambulatory dermatology clinic in Chelsea, Massachusetts, which were then visited in person. Data was collected during April of 2018 in the greater Boston area. Brand name, steroid ingredient, and vehicle was collected where possible. Of 10 ethnic beauty stores, all had topical skin lining products advertising high potency corticosteroids, including beta-methasone and clobetasol, as you can see from the chart here. At least three brands were available at each store, with the retail price ranging from $4.99 to $12.99 per 30 gram tube. Furthermore, in many countries outside of the United States, Non-prescription skin lightening agents are on the market and easily obtained in stores. Some of the active ingredients are listed here, including the common adverse effects and serious adverse reactions. For example, mercury has been found in a number of products, which at high levels may cause neuropsychiatric toxicity, nephrotoxicity, and pneumonitis. Steroids, when used twice per day for skin lightening, may cause atrophy, contact dermatitis, striae, and may lead to HPA axis disruption, glaucoma, cataracts, and even steroid addiction syndrome. 
The practice of skin lightening has profound cultural and socio-political roots in countries where lighter skin is associated with social capital and perceived increased attractiveness. In some regions, the estimated prevalence of these practices among women ranges from 25% to 67%. Lightening products are highly marketed to individuals with skin of color, and consumers typically use these products twice daily or even more to their entire body continuously, since discontinuation is associated with increased pigmentation. The sale of illegal skin lightening creams has been identified as an emerging threat by the United Kingdom Consumer Protection Agency, the National Trading Standards, and is cited in their Consumer Harm Report of 2018. Future investigations may undertake the chemical analysis to detect true concentration of steroids in these products and the potential concentration of mercury as well. We intend for this report to help characterize the public health concern of unregulated skin lightening products and hope that dermatologists gain awareness of easily available non-prescription potent corticosteroids and may convey the dangerous and illegal nature of these products to their patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samara. Um, Maggie, I, it seems like we had difficulty showing the, the uh, visual slides with the recording. So if it's, a, if it's possible for you to share the screen with the slides that we sent you ahead of time now, um, perhaps we can refer to the charts if there are questions during the Q&A. Sure. Let me get right into it. In the meantime, I see a question from a medical student named Amara. Welcome. Um, Amara's question is that back in my home country, skin lightening is well known and even encouraged. What would you recommend be done to educate patients about the problems with um, these skin lightening products? Um, so Amara, uh, thank you so much for your question. And uh, you know, the, the paper that our group published um, in the International Women's uh, Journal of Women's Dermatology was actually a collaboration with WDS members in many countries around the world. And this was something that we worked on in the past year with Dr. Ganji Handog in the Philippines, Dr. Heshin Chung in Korea, Dr. Rashmi Sarkar in India, Dr. Hassan Galadari in uh, Dubai, um, Dr. Monica Ajale in Brazil, um, and you know, so and, and many colleagues. And what we found, and Dr. Susan Taylor, of course, um, who uh, you know was really uh, has been a mentor to me uh, in you know in this endeavor, and you know what we found is that there are initiatives, and also Dr. Nikosa Delova in South Africa, and we found out that there are there are actually many endeavors for public health education in various countries. In the Boston area, I worked with a local reporter to do news campaigns. Um, you know, to spread awareness about unsafe skin lightening practices. For example, uh, a glutathione in infusion clinic opened in the uh, Boston area in predominantly African-American communities. And there were billboards that were highly offensive and targeting uh, persons with darker skin types that they should come and get these unsafe skin lightening treatments that have actually been condemned by the FDA. And so we worked together in public health campaign. And I know, for example, Dr. Sarkar has worked on public health campaigns in India, and Dr. Deloza um, has worked on public health campaigns in South America, sorry, in South Africa. And so, um, you know, these are things that the WDS members are championing and also working sometimes with industry. For example, um, in India, uh, a very well-known brand of skin lightening products called Fair and Lovely actually had to change their name and uh, you know rethink, rethink their branding. And so I think it's gonna be a combination of dermatologists um, really championing these efforts and, uh, and raising awareness. So thank you for the question. Samara and Dr. Karosh, I would like to say thank you so much for the work you're doing in this area. I was able to see the um, you know, the charts before when we were reviewing your talk 
and they were fantastic. I wish we could pull them up. Maggie, is there any way to pull them up at all? I'm this having just a little bit of technical difficulty here. No, but that's I, okay. Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Waltman. And and don't worry, Maggie, we all understand in the era of the pandemic, there have been many technical issues. We, we thought that by sending them ahead of time, we would actually um, be helping to mitigate that. But uh, perhaps for anyone that's interested, we, we are happy for them to be shared on the WBS website somewhere and, um, and folks can you know, refer to the charts and tables that we made. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Karosh and, and Samara as well. And thank you so much for your flexibility. I would love to, to post those just because it really is such an interesting and important topic. Thank you. All right. So we will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Victoria Wirth. And Dr. Wirth comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania, where she is a professor of dermatology and medicine, and where she is also the chief of dermatology at the Philadelphia VA. Dr. Wirth, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. And can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I would say, the need for advances in cutaneous lupus. Um, and um, this is my complex, which is a very new thing because usually nobody cared about cutaneous lupus, but I bolded some of the things that I'm going to be talking about and they're not things that are available, but hopefully in the future, we will have more to offer our patients that look like this. We know that CLE is disfiguring, uncomfortable disease that harms patients' quality of life. And for obvious reasons, there's disfigurement in visible areas such as the face, scalp, neck, and hands. And lupus is really second only to clinical depression and its effects on health-related quality of life. So there has been a shift uh, in the sense that we've only had one approved drug for SLE in 60 years, and that was belimumab. But if it was only approved for SLE, and so our patients with CLE actually don't can't access it for insurance reasons. And um, really no drugs have been approved for CLE except hydroxychloroquine and, and glucocorticoids. So skin is a potential interest for evaluating the response now in SLE. And part of the reason is we now have a validated disease severity tool that basically gives you an activity and a damage for skin and allow it's been validated with many studies over the last 15 years that have now um, allowed it to be used in um, prospective studies. So when we characterize patients using this uh, disease severity tool in terms of mild, moderate, and severe, what you can see is that the um, emotion of impact on quality of life in terms of the emotional component is higher in those who have severe disease than moderate versus mild and clearly having the most effect in emotions, but also having effects on symptoms and functioning. And I might point out this is using the skin decks that Meg Crin developed. So one thing to say is that um, about 10% of the patients that we see prospectively really are not responding to any medication, including you know, thalidomide or lenalidomide. And the, all of the red here, um, many of these patients have to go on to methotrexate or mycophenolate because the drugs that we have are not working. And obviously those are pretty toxic and require a lot of monitoring for the patients. So we know the patients who tend to be refractory have often more, more often have uh, generalized discoid lupus or hypertrophic discoid lupus and less likely localized DLE and subacute cutaneous lupus. And we know that antimalarial that we have now, hydroxychloroquine, works in about 55% of our patients who need to go on systemic therapy if topicals are not working. And as time is going on, there's increased sensitivity of tests that are done for visual fields for looking for eye toxicity. And this is leading to problems with long-term use in some patients. And then also we now can recognize that there may be a need in some high-risk patients to check EKGs for QTC prolongation. As, as you know, in the era of COVID, this has come out. Um, these are some of the drugs that can also prolong QTC. So we have to monitor these a little bit in our patients who are um, getting hydroxychloroquine. And also this drug doesn't work for everybody. Now, many of us used to use quinacrine, which worked in two thirds of the patients who were hydroxychloroquine refractory but that is no longer available in the United States. And that has led to a real problem because it's now been over a year since that drug went away. And now patients are coming off uh, the drug since it does stick around for often eight to 12 months and are now beginning to flare. So we really need some decent alternatives. 
So I'm going to speak about some that we would say right now, either investigational or really for our most refractory patients. Uh, and But I think it's important to know that these are available. And these would include things like thalidomide, which we've had for years, and more recently, lenalidomide. And then I'm going to touch on some of the newer things coming along that relate to decreasing type 1 interferons in the skin and systemically. So a number of years ago, we uh, did some work um, with lenalidomide in a very small open-label prospective study that looked again at patients with refractory disease, showing that four out of five patients did get improvement. Uh, and a larger study that you can see down here was done in Spain and showed that um, patients very rapidly improve. And in this case, 86% of the patients had a complete response when they had been otherwise refractory. And so again, very important in the sense that lenalidomide doesn't seem to have the same neurotoxicity and it provides a good alternative for some of the patients similar to the ones that I showed you on the first slide. So some of, I wanted to kind of give you a peek into some of the things that are coming down the pike that I think will be important for our patients. So in uh, the setting of having um, some data on lenalidomide and the fact that it's a hugely expensive drug that's gonna only be marketed for oncology indications, there's now been development of ibertamide, which is a lenalidomide derivative, otherwise in the initial studies called CC220. And this has effects on Icarus and Ilus, which encode zinc finger transcription factors that are involved in immune cell development that are, and these immune cells can have effects in terms of lupus. And we know that these um, factors, zinc uh, finger transcription factors are overexpressed in the PBMCs of patients with SLE and that there's some polymorphisms of these that are associated with an increased risk of developing SLE. So ibertamide is a high affinity ligand of cerebellin, which is part of an A3 ubiquitin ligase, ligase complex and binds the cerebellin and reduces these uh, zinc finger protein levels in B cells, T cells, and monocytes. And again, it's been screened to be more potent than thalidomide or lenalidomide. So this was an early uh, phase two A study of um, looking at the uh, skin and patients treat it with the, this uh, CC220. And what you can appreciate is the red, the placebo didn't really change. Whereas the patients who got four different doses seem to get improvement. And so now in about two weeks at the American College of Rheumatology meetings, there's gonna be this presentation and this is online now in terms of an abstract. So I can tell you about it, but this is the placebo. And, um, and you can see it's a pretty large placebo response, but these three doses um, did better than placebo in a statistically significant way, and particularly patients with SCLE and chronic CLE, the ones looking at the skin. There was also effects at, with SLE as well. And so this is something to think about that maybe it'll be easier for our patients to access because of the cost of lenalidomide, which literally is like $600 a pill. Now, in terms of um, another approach then uh, is decreasing type 1 interferon, and um, there are antibodies now against the IFNAR receptor, which is a phase, uh, and there's a phase 3 that's been completed, and, um, and basically that study uh, has shown that there's improvement in the skin in a way that's been um, important and, again, will be presented. So another approach has been uh, with PDCs, uh, targeting PDCs. And this is uh, looking at a, uh, an antigen in the skin, BDCA2, which is a, a receptor on the uh, plasma cytoidendritic cells. And we know that these cells are present in the skin. So this is a CLE biopsy, and all these pink cells are PDCs. Um, and uh, basically, they amplify lesional inflammation. And PDCs are activated by TOL7 and TOL9 agonists. Uh, and um, these include RNA and DNA in the setting of lupus and induce interferon uh, induced uh, cytokines and chemokines that recruit T cells into the skin and are part of an inflammatory milieu that gets set up. So we know that there is an interferon signature in um, CLE PBMCs. So this is not just even the skin, but actually in the blood. And this happens in patients who either have SLE or just skin disease. You can find an interferon signature with certain genes that are upregulated. Um, in these patients in the blood, and that's seen in SCLE and discoid lupus, where you have interface dermatitis, not seen in tumid, uh, not seen in healthy controls, but certainly present, as we know, in SLE, and it's actually a marker that's looked at in a lot of studies as an outcome. We also know that the interference score in the blood is correlating with skin activity, so the higher the interference score, the higher the classy activity, and this is uh, showing, again, that this is a big, important driver, at least, for skin, and again, is found in the blood as well. 
So type one interference signaling leads to a, a number of cellular responses. And so the type one interference that are produced by cells such as the PDCs then bind to this IFNR receptor and their two uh, sub receptors, IFNR one and two, which lead to all this downstream uh, signaling with JAK1, TIC2, and then certain stats leading to an inflammatory response. And so this is a cascade of events that we now have several different ways to think about trying to block. And one of the ways it's been done has been with a drug called anafrolamab, which is against the IFNR receptor. And it's an antibody that blocks a lot of these type 1 interferons. And so this is showing you what happens to uh, interferon uh, signatures in the blood. The gene signatures go down as the patient's getting this antibody against the receptor and go back up when they stop getting it. And so there was a study that looked at um, placebo and two doses of anafrolamab, and this is before and after. Um, and you can appreciate that um, looking at the skin scores, um, there was uh, much less of an improvement relative to these two doses. And so this led to the doing a phase three trial, which is going to also be presented in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and actually, this one will present some of the skin data, but it has been published actually in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what you can see is at 12 weeks, which was the endpoint that they looked at for skin, um, you can, there was double the number of patients who improved with this um, IFNR receptor relative to placebo. So again, very hopeful, but this was a study done in SLE patients and they were interested in looking at skin, but likely um, the FDA will only approve it for SLE and patients who have SLE with skin disease. It doesn't really still help our patients very much. But that leads me on to another, two other approaches that I think might, hopefully one of them at least, has been really looking at skin lupus in particular. And um, this uh, is the anti-BDCA2 antibody, which decreases um, plasmacytoid dendritic cell production of interferon and other fl inflammatory cytokines. So this is the receptor on the PDC. This is a PDC. And this antibody binds the receptor and leads to internalization and then downregulates type 1 interferon and leads to downregulation of these pro-inflammatory chemokines and cytokines that are driving this immune response. So this is looking at um, uh, the skin of patients with CLE um, who, this is baseline, and then week four was after just one injection. And what you can see is many, but not all, of the patients had improvement. And this is looking at a protein in the skin that's staining red that is present at baseline before the injection and is gone at week four. And similarly, you can see that in many of the cases, the uh, type 1 interferon signature went down because the PDCs could no longer make interferon. So there's, this has now uh, led to a phase 2 trial, um, which has just been completed and will be presented. But I want to point out that there was a part B to the study, which actually was, I think, one of the very first studies looking at CLE. And the part A was SLE with some skin disease. So what you can see is of the patients who had CLE, there were some that had SCLE and others about 20, uh, another group that had discoid lupus, about two thirds of them. And you can see many of them met criteria for SLE, but the dr driver for them being in the study was the skin. And this is showing a dose response. So when they got more, the a higher dose of the drug, the, there was a greater response uh, in terms of the efficacy of the medication. And then here you can appreciate that the percent change in the skin score um, was, went down pretty well in all three dose groups relative to placebo. And this was a significant result. And so um, this will likely go on and become a phase three trial. And that will be very exciting to have a drug that's targeting CLE potentially and may work for some, but likely not all of our patients. Now, I want to end by talking also about another way of depleting P P PDCs, not the internalization of a receptor, but this one actually targets PDCs and depletes them uh, from the blood and from the, the skin. And this is showing you the PDCs, how much they come down with an antibody that targets and depletes the PDCs. So at all these doses, it comes down relative to placebo. And so this is looking at, again, at the percent change in the skin score. And you can appreciate at the higher dose of this antibody that the skin is getting better, quite a bit better in a way that's really remarkable for the patient in terms of their improvement relative to placebo and a lower dose. So again, this is going to be presented in a week or two. And it's really exciting that these are really some of the first studies that are positive and that may make a difference for our patients. 
So there are many opportunities for translational studies now to better understand the disease process and the heterogeneity. Um, we are able to measure the skin. There are more options for therapeutically resistant patients in the pipeline. And I, so I think this is a very um, exciting time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wirth. And thank you for all of the cutting edge work that you're doing to help treat our, our lupus patients. That's amazing. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Wirth? I don't see any in the chat box or sorry, the Q&A box. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again, Dr. Worth. We really appreciate it. Yep, my pleasure. Okay. All right, so next um, we are um, very happy to have Dr. Antonella Tosti here. Uh, she is actually in Italy right now, I'm very jealous. <laughs> um, but she, uh, so she was able to pre-record her talk actually today. And so that is what we're gonna, we're going to try to show Maggie, I'm not sure. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have some good luck with this. Um, but anyway, Dr. Um, Antonella Tosti, she's the Frederick Brandt Endowed Professor of Dermatology at the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. So Maggie, do you have her talk? Maggie? All right, how about we take a one minute bathroom break for everybody? <laughs> okay, never mind. Come back. <laughs> Yeah, let's maybe take a one minute um, bathroom break and then we will pull up Dr. Tosti's uh, presentation, everybody, okay? A lot to find a way to do the best okay. online teledermatology oh, and teletrichology. And so I published this paper recently on the JDV journal, uh, that uh, paper that shows how you can do teletrichoscopy um, in the area. And Maggie, if it doesn't work, we can always um, move on to the next speaker. <laughs> which happens to be Dr. Hinshaw. <laughs> <laughs> it's pulling up, can you hear me? No. Oh. It's pulling up for me, but it for some reason is not sharing the screen. So I'm gonna work on that right this second. Okay. I was sharing before, <laughs> so I know that it should be working. Uh, okay. Okay, I see it. Yay. Hey, okay. So good evening. Okay. I, I perfect I up now. <laughs> yes, it's been it's been about a minute, so everyone should be back from their bathroom break. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and show her wonderful presentation. Thank you, Maggie. So sorry about that, but here we go. We are discussing uh, now the diagnosis and treatment of her disorders during the COVID pandemic. And I have no conflicts that are relevant with this presentation. So um, the idea that you...
You can do many um, examines. You can do a pull test, a tug test, you can evaluate the severity of shedding, take measures of the ponytails and measures of the hairline recession in front of the patient. This is my friend, Colombina Vincenzi, who is a doctor in Italy, and they did the actress for me to show you the pull test. You have to teach the patient how to do the pull test and then look at how many hair they got or the tag test and uh, you, of course they always uh, send you pictures so evaluating the shedding is not difficult you can use the scales that are published online to um, to uh, uh, quantify the shedding and uh, this is from my friend uh, Fernanda Torres from Brazil where they often measure the ponytail and so you can measure the ponytail have the patient the, the, uh, doing the measure and evaluate that and uh, you can, of course, uh, measure the hairline recession in front of a Brazilian patient. So you can do most of the things you do in your real life, maybe more than many dermatologists do. And uh, you can, uh, I always tell the patients to, to uh, download the application also in, in the phone, because in this way they can show you the scalp during the visit. And then I developed teletrichoscopy. I'm very proud of this development. And you can use many different tools I'm going to show you here. You can use just the iPhone. iPhone or smartphone in general are, are good. And even if the picture is not of high quality, like here, you can definitely see this is a alopecia reata, and this is an exclamation mark here. So you, you have the information. And here you can definitely see there are thick scales, maybe scalp psoriasis. You, you may not be able to evaluate that uh, on telemedicine, but this is maybe a patient you want to see in person. And here, this is a patient you can see the hairline is something wrong. You see papules, you, you see a cast. This is a patient you need to see in person. And you can ask the patient to download applications that may help for macro photography. And these are very cheap, like $4 applications. And this is an application for iPhone. You see very well this patch of alopecia. You can see all these black dots. In reality, this patient was using Antrally, and those black dots were due to Antrally. This is another case. And here you can see variability, for instance, this is uh, enough to uh, allow you a diagnosis of androgenetic alopecia, you see hair of different thickness. You can ask patients to buy um, lens to attach to the, uh, their phone. This is more complicated in general because these lens require some skills to take good pictures. I try many lens, the one that I think is better, best is this one. It's, again, it's not expensive, less than $30. And of course, this is a picture stake with the lens. You can see very high, well the vellus hair and the hairline. So you know this is not frontal fibrosing alopecia because, of course, in these patients, you all have to, to uh, ask for pictures of the hairlines as the frontal fibrosing alopecia is so frequent. And it's uh, enough to check variability. You see, no variability in this picture is not uh, androgenetic alopecia. And you can see cas using this uh, lens. But the best uh, probably option is to ask the patient to buy one of these uh, microscopes. And uh, these, again, are very cheap. And you attach them to your phone or to your computer. Just be careful to explain the patient that they have to buy an instrument that is, uh, um, is good for their uh, uh, iPhone because some of them work just with the iPhone, other work with other type of uh, smartphones. And uh, you see that, that you have to teach them how to take the pictures and show them which pictures you want because otherwise you get pictures of the air shaft. You have to show them that you want pictures of the skull with the air emerging. And uh, Professor Bicali from Catania published a few years ago a, a paper uh, about these low cost instruments. 
and the issue that they are effective in many uh, situations, but may not show, of course, the same uh, quality uh, that uh, you have, can get with video dermatoscopy instrument. But today, this instrument improved, and I can see yellow dots and other features with this instrument. I'm going to show you some examples. This is a picture taken with one instrument. You can see the hair, the uh, yellow dots. You can see many features and they're very ultra easy to use. And you can see the short growing hair. And of course, here you see uh, variability and you can make a diagnosis of androgenetic alopecia. Even if the patient didn't take a, a very focused picture, we're not looking for perfect pictures we are looking for making a diagnosis. Here you see all these yellow dots. I think this may be alopecia reata incognito. I want this patient to have a biopsy. And here, of course, you see all these uh, peripyral cast and crusts. You need uh, uh, to schedule this patient for a biopsy again. And in this case, I saw all these scales. I thought of psoriasis. I at the patient to come, and you know, this is the photo find that the patient had psoriasis. So I believe that this is very important to select patients you want to see in person and from patients you can follow up online. And the, just uh, this is the take home message. So these are very important. They allow the proper examination in a total safety, and patients are really usually very, very happy. And then they spend more time with you uh, with the tele trichoscopy and tele trichology than sometimes when you see them in person. And just a few words about treatment. And what I want to focus is androgenetic alopecia, as there are many data now showing that androgenetic alopecia may be a very bad risk factor for severe COVID-19 infection. And so um, patients with um, male patients with COVID and androgenetic alopecia, they usually um, go worse. And so the question is, can anti-androgen be useful? And I've been working with a team of other doctors in the world looking at this. And we have some data that show that may be true. And uh, as androgen is a very important uh, uh, factor in, uh, in, uh, for the infection and for the uh, um, uh, evolution of the disease. And uh, so treatment with uh, fat, alpha reductase inhibitors may help and may prevent severe infection and mortality. And data are accumulating, but for instance, this is a paper showing patients with cancer, prostate cancer, that of course they have an increased risk of uh, uh, infection. And they show that uh, the patients who received under the prevention therapy were somehow protected from, from the infections. You see here, uh, comparing the total number of positive case patients with uh, uh, prostate cancer receiving anti-androgens at a significantly lower risk of uh, infections compared with the controls. And uh, so this is uh, um, something that is uh, very interesting. And this is a, a recent paper I was part uh, of that show that anti-androgens may protect the outcome. You see here uh, patients going to um, ICU, and you see the very significant difference between patients receiving anti-androgens and patients not receiving anti-androgens. So this is my last slide, and I'm sorry not be able to be with you for the discussion as I'm in Italy, and. Uh, I'm in Bologna, so uh, love from Italy, love from Bologna, and uh, have a, a, a nice evening. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Wonderful. Well, that was a great talk on a very timely topic. Good evening. So we yeah. really appreciate that. Um,
All right, so I think we're going to move um, right along to our next speaker, Dr. Molly Hinshaw. So Dr. Hinshaw is the director of the Nail Clinic and also the section chief of dermatopathology. Uh, she's also an associate professor of dermatology at the Department uh, of Dermatology at UW-Madison. Uh, and she's also currently the president of the Women's Dermatological Society. So Dr. Hinshaw, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Woltman. Can you hear me? I hope. Yes, and we oh, can wonderful. Hear slides. Okay, great. You can hear me and see me. I am so, so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you all for being here for the first ever virtual Parade of Roses Medical Education Conference. Thank you to Dr. Woltman and Dr. Weiss, Dr. Lukart Weiss, who is joining us uh, from Munich uh, as co-chairs for this event. And thank you to Maggie for all your hard work in putting this together and keeping us on task and moving along. It's a lot of moving parts, but we're so thrilled to be here with you. My task tonight is to talk with you about surgical techniques to optimize outcomes after nail surgery. And this is something near and dear to my heart because I would love nothing more than for every dermatologist uh, to be very comfortable with nail surgery because we are the masters of it. If we think about who does nail surgery on hands in particular, I'm gonna tell you that we are the go-to professionals within all of medicine. And, um, uh, and that's, I've been asked to give talks in different, two different groups, surgical groups, podiatry, et cetera. And we really do nail biopsies routinely it's, um, uh, you know, as the uh, experts. So I want us all to be very comfortable um, and be very uh, happy that we can provide our patients the comfort, the pain management, the minimal risks that we know we can do. And in you know 10 minutes, I'm hoping to give you as many pearls as possible uh, as, uh, to do so. So in, we're going to make some assumptions here tonight, which is that we have a patient who comes to us with an indication for nail surgery. Of course, not every nail issue requires a surgery, but there are some uh, primary, uh, you know, presentations or signs that would warrant that. And I think we're all very familiar with those. We're going to make an assumption that we have one of those um, to address. And then I'm going to roll through many things that are similar amongst the various approaches that you can use as pearls in doing your nail surgeries. So I have um, a couple nail related um, conflicts of interest to mention. I'm not going to be discussing anything related to uh, a Cure Medical is something that's looking at treatment of onychomycosis, and I'm a board member for Council of Nail Disorders, but I won't be talking about either of those tonight. Uh, we cannot do what we do alone. The Women's Derm Society cannot do what we do without all our wonderful members and our wonderful staff, and the same thing is true in the nail world. So I have learned and benefited from wonderful colleagues. I always have to give a great shout out to my wonderful mentor, Dr. Phoebe Rich, who helped me get my start in nails. Um, and why we're here tonight is because none of us want a pterygium. We want to avoid at all costs uh, anything that would hurt a patient. And in the nail, case of nail surgery, it, call, it involves permanent nail dystrophy or scarring. And to do that, we have lots of different things we can do along the way, pre-surgical, intraoperative, and then peri and postoperative period that really gives ourselves the best chance of giving the patient the best outcome. And again, I mentioned there are a variety of surgical procedures, right? Punch, tangential shave, lateral longitudinal excision, but many of the strategies that we're gonna use for any and all of those are gonna be uh, the same to give ourselves the same benefit and outcome. One of those is the preoperative period. And so we, you know, everyone has a handout. You're welcome to take a screen grab of mine, use what you like, discard what you don't, but I make sure to spend time, even if I'm doing surgery that day, right? Um, in the moment for the patient, it, I make sure that everybody knows exactly what to expect before the surgery, during the surgery, and after the surgery. And it's in writing, we talk about it. And this really helps us save time in um, patient fear, complications, uh, like overuse of a digit after surgery. It gives them the comfort and the confidence in what we're gonna do, because we're confident in what we're gonna do. and We know we're gonna give them uh, the best outcome we can. Do, we can. Uh, necessarily, you know, we have a lot of different things that we will do to make that happen, and they're fearful. They need us to reassure them. I never stop anticoagulants for nail surgeries. Um, I, I personally don't use epinephrine in patients with Raynaud's, but I will use it in patients who don't have Raynaud's. Um, and I also give them a lot of reassurance that I'm to control their pain. I give them strategies, including on that wound care handout about keeping the, the hand or foot elevated, 
um, making sure that they keep the bandage, you know, snug enough, but not so snug it's cutting off blood flow. I talk, I will talk with you at the end of this talk about how to choose your analgesic, if any, for a nail surgery. And then I offer them appointments for their first wound uh, check and then a nail check or two with me. It's important that we know how the nail is going to heal uh, and what, uh, the, you know, sort of how to educate the patient about what to expect. So this is a quick visual for you, day of surgery for removal um, of what turned out uh, to be an onical papilloma, not squamous cell, thankfully. Um, lateral curl, as you can see here, this is a lateral longitudinal avulsion, laying the plate back down, stitch, stitch, and here we are at seven days, already getting some nice reepithelialization. That proximal nail fold is already reattaching and the new nail is growing through. So it's nice to be able to reassure patients um, you know, what their nail is gonna look like at various stages of the procedure. So um, I don't know if you guys can see that panel. I'm trying to get rid of it, sorry. <laughs> I'll try to move it out of the way. I use various techniques for distracting the patient from the anesthesia portion because that can be uncomfortable. And this little buzzy bee that you might already be using in your office for your kiddos. I like it for nail surgery. I think nine tenths of patients like it. Um, and then here we are talking about, I'm gonna get into the actual choice of surgical procedure. And the bulk of what we're gonna talk about today is the tangential shave biopsy. Okay, so that's right here. This is our tangential shave. That's pretty much the workhorse in nail surgery. So I'm gonna spend time on that. As a patient comes to you, here are our four primary reasons for nail surgery. Of course, longitudinal melanonychia with unusual features, onychodystrophy of a single nail, which could be a nail, which you should, um, be concerned about a neoplasm of some sort, onychodystrophy of multiple nails rapidly evolving, that's lichen planus, and then typically lichen planus would be rapidly evolving, and erythronychia, which could be squamous cell or amelanotic melanoma. And then here, as we go through these couple examples, we have our options for surgery. Um, I wanted to mention briefly two slides, this one and the next, talking about the lack of um, uh, consistency in terms of the histologic diagnosis of melanoma of the nail unit and the clinical presentation. And the summary here is that clinical judgment for, um, should outweigh really the clinical presentation. So you don't want to be biopsying all melanocyte activation, which is that gray brown you know, band that you may see in a single nail or multiple nails. But if you have a pigmented lesion with bands of pigmentation and um, you have concerns, clinical concerns for whatever reason, it's broadening, the patient says it's a new, it's greater than you know, three or four millimeters broad. Any concern um, absolutely is um, um, a consideration for biopsy and discussion with the patient at, at a minimum clinical follow-up. This is another uh, case series that demonstrates that nicely. Specifically, I wanna show you that uh, in one of the cases here, melanoma in situ presented as only a two millimeter broad band. So here we have longitudinal melanonychia with unusual features. It's quite broad. And we have a couple reasonable surgical approaches. This is the tangential, sh the tangential shave really should be the workhorse for this presentation. And anytime we have to lift off a nail plate, we want to do it in a, as partial a way as possible. I always tell the residents, uh, take only what you need from the nail and put everything back the way you found it. So these are various approaches. You'll find others in the literature essentially lifting up the portion of the nail, the nail that you need to access the primary lesion. In this case, I know we're all aware the pigmented lesion lives in the matrix. And to perform the tangential shave, really want to try to score two millimeters around the lesion, hold the scalpel horizontal to the matrix surface, and you're just scoring. You're not cutting down to periosteum, just surface scoring, shave removed very thinly so that you can see through the uh, you know, epithelium and superficial dermis to the actual suture or to the actual um, scalpel itself, and then um, perform your shave. So here we are, and I wanna point out, I have a, this is a 15C blade. I really like these for all nail surgeries. 15 blades are, a little bit big for the nail unit. So this is a 15C blade if you're looking to you know, get any for your office. See how small that is? I'm just surface scoring this lesion. See how far around I am of this lesion? Don't be concerned with that. You're gonna go extremely thin, okay? And just, you should literally be able to see the blade through the skin, through the matrix, 
these studies have been done showing how um, thick or thin, if you want to think about it that way, the tissue is when completely removed in this fashion. If you can see the blade through the skin that you're doing your tangential shave, you're on average, you're already going to be at about 0.67 millimeters in thickness, which is plenty thick to identify an invasive melanoma. But again, you're removing and just come all the way through and make sure you take that as one piece. Okay. This in con contrast is the 15 blade. So 15 blade, 15 seed. See how much nice, how much smaller that is and more elegant. So here we are in the surgery. Here we are post-op and here we are immediately after. And you have rolled that nail plate to the side we lay it back down, it serves as a natural bandage. It's not gonna reattach. Stitches in a few simple interrupts um, with, uh, I use polyglactin 910, I'll show you that in a minute. A little stitch so the nail doesn't lift up while the patient is doing their self cares and you're done. Those are self-absorbing sutures and they will fall out when they're ready, usually about two weeks later. I put this tissue on a nail template. This is filter paper. You can ask your derm path lab to send you some of that to have in your office and then put it on a nail cassette so it doesn't all roll up and um, get cut incorrectly in derm path. And here we are at a 10 day post-op visit. Okay, this is what you wanna see, but all, you know, expectedly all this pigment is here. It's deposited in the plate, fine. A little bit of hemorrhage in the background. The nail is down nicely. Most importantly, we wanna make sure the nail plate stays tucked in under the proximal nail fold so that we don't have risks of pterygium or scarring between the nail matrix and the actual um, eponychium or the undersurface of the proximal nail fold, okay? So we've removed the lesion here, lay this plate back down, stitch it back together, and then it's gonna heal beautifully. And the other procedure I wanted to share with you, uh, because again, it's these are the two workhorses, the ones you're gonna do most often, it's fine to do for a, in some cases, a punch through the nail plate or a punch after you've done a partial avulsion. Those would be for narrow lesions or lesions that you're concerned go all the way down to the periosteum and you really want depth. So three millimeter biopsies are just fine. So if you have an onychodystrophy of a single nail, depends on where it's located in the nail. Um, but the options for all of our, you know, onychodystrophy of a single nail are located over here. Simply match that sort of surgical approach option list to where my where is my issue. So if I wanted to address this lesion, I would have to do either a trapdoor avulsion and lift up the whole nail plate or a distal lateral avulsion. If you wanted to, you could literally go through the nail plate with a three millimeter punch. And that is certainly an, op an option. You might miss the tumor. That's why it's not the preferred option. So a partial avulsion and a punch biopsy of the lesion is what was chosen here. And I wanted to just briefly show you where you can do your three millimeter punches. We don't wanna do three millimeter punches or punch biopsies through the proximal matrix because you'll get a pterygium most likely. In the distal matrix, meaning where the matrix is visible um, you know, through the nail plate uh, as the lunula, it's okay to do a three millimeter punch. And in the nail bed, it is fine to do a three millimeter punch. So here I did a distal lateral avulsion a three millimeter punch to this lesion because it was all ulcerated and this is a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, okay? And then briefly, in terms of intraoperative anesthesia, workhorse is right here. Distal uh, block, distal digital block is what you're gonna do most of the time. And I use proximal bolar blocks when I have a painful distal digit or a very anxious patient. And when we're doing a distal digital block, Make sure, I use some distractive techniques. I don't have my buzzy in this video, but you can see me moving the digit. You know, we do that for you know our any skin surgery, but buzzies, some sort of movement is always very helpful. The, the angle of the needle needs to be about a 60 degree angle, and you're aiming that needle down the longitudinal axis of the digit, and you want to see the blanching. Okay, I would use um, ropivacaine 0.05% without epinephrine for first choice for my, if I only had one anesthesia, one um, anesthetic to use. And uh, that is nice tumescence and good longstanding pain control. These two slides really just show you that when you do need a proximal block, you sh can, and I do only do one injection site and that is into the proximal um, digit into the subcutaneous tissue, not along the sides, prospective randomized Studies have shown equivalency from a single volar block into the subcutis 
equivalent anesthesia and outcomes to two anesthesias on either side and you, you limit your risk of complications. So that's what I do if I need a proximal block. And then in terms of hemostasis, you really almost never need cautery, almost never need aluminum chloride. All you need is pressure and some tumescence, okay? And I mentioned about suture choice. Uh, for most nail surgeries, um, I use a polyglactin 910, a rapidly absorbing vicro suture unless I'm doing a larger surgery like a lateral longitudinal excision or something and you need greater um, you know, strength because these are more delicate sutures, but they're, they're rapidly absorbing and work beautifully for every surgery that I've shown you so far. And pain management, very important. Um, for a tangential shave, I do give people um, some hydrocodone acetaminophen. I would say that 70% of people tell me they took maybe two of them. I'll give them six and we'll see, uh, typically have them take something for pain before when the numbing medication, um, when the local anesthesia starts to wear off and then another something before bed. So in addition to pain management, um, if you're doing something like phenolization, you don't need any, any prescription pain management at all. Punch biopsies, I don't do any pain prescription pain management at all. But for tangential shaves, lateral longitudinal decisions, I do give them some prescription um, a narcotic pain medication, just a, just a limited amount. In addition, tell them to keep the limb elevated. Um, while it's anesthetized, they should baby it. And, and, and uh, when it starts to wake up, they can let pain be their guide. So in summary, I want to emphasize that we can all do this. If we're not already doing nail surgery, you can do it. And with some pearls I hope to have shared here um, and any um, questions going forward, give me an email, put, a, put something in the chat. I'm happy to help. We are the uh, masters of nail surgery, bi nail biopsies. And if we don't do them, um, we will have delays in diagnosis. So I'm just really happy to be here with you all tonight. And thank you for having me. Dr. Hinshaw, thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you for all those valuable pearls um, for nail surgery. And it doesn't look like there's any questions. So thank you so much. Thanks. All right. And what we'll do is we will move to our next speaker, uh, our only medical student on the panel. All right. So this is um, Alana Deutsch. And she is a medical student and a supportive oncodermatology research fellow at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So Alana, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, as Dr. Waltman said, my name is Alana Deutsch and I am a fourth year medical student at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And today I'll be presenting a study entitled Utilizing Fibrosis 4 Score to assess risk for hepatic fibrosis in patients with psoriasis on methotrexate. There were many people that made this project possible and none of them nor myself have any disclosures to report. So as has been known for many years, methotrexate is a cost-effective and valuable treatment option for psoriasis, although its use requires close monitoring for systemic toxicities. In 2009, the American Academy of Dermatology National Psoriasis Foundation Consensus Conference released guidelines that recommended that all patients with psoriasis taking long-term methotrexate be monitored for hepatotoxicity with liver function tests every one to three months. It's important to recognize, however, that these laboratories have poor performance measures, which is why liver biopsy remains the gold standard for monitoring in this patient population, despite its invasiveness and morbidities. So the timing of a liver biopsy in relation to start or continuation of methotrexate treatment is based on a patient's comorbid hepatotoxic risk factors but just to put it in perspective, even a patient with no hepatotoxic risk factors who is taking seven and a half milligrams of methotrexate weekly will require a liver biopsy before three years of continuous therapy. I think it's important at this time to also mention that since our study was completed 
new consensus guidelines have been released for monitoring hepatotoxicity in this patient population, and I'm going to touch on those a little bit later on. Because of the recognized invasiveness of liver biopsies, two novel diagnostic measures, the Fibrosis 4 score and the FibroScan, have been introduced to assess risk for hepatic fibrosis non-invasively. So the Fibrosis 4 score is a lab-based scoring system that has good predictive accuracy for fibrosis on biopsy, and its performance measures actually far exceed those of liver function tests alone. While the scoring system hasn't been studied in psoriasis, it has been validated in other disease states, including non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as chronic hepatitis B and C. So taking a look at the equation for the calculation of fibrosis force score, we see that it's actually fairly simple to calculate. You just need the liver function tests, which were presumably being drawn anyways, as well as the patient's age and platelet count. And there are actually multiple online calculators that you can just plug these values into, which will quickly calculate your fibrosis four score for you. The second novel non-invasive diagnostic is the FibroScan. And this is a specialized ultrasound that uses transient elastography to estimate median liver stiffness. And just as with the fibrosis four score, the liver stiffness measured on FibroScan is a close approximation of the true stage of hepatic fibrosis that you would find on liver biopsy. So to further investigate the use of these non-invasive diagnostics, the objectives of our study were twofold. First, we wish to utilize the fibrosis four scoring system and the FibroScan to identify patients with psoriasis on methotrexate who are at risk for hepatic fibrosis. And second, we sought to determine if there were possible associations between cumulative methotrexate dose, treatment duration, and fibrosis 4 score with the presence of liver fibrosis as assessed by FibroScan or a biopsy. So to define our study cohort, we used a data collection tool that's embedded in our hospital's electronic medical record, and that allowed us to isolate patients with a diagnosis of psoriasis who have been taking at least three months of methotrexate. And during the chart review, we excluded patients if they were found to be non-compliant with treatment, if they were lost to follow up, had missing laboratory values, or were primarily managed by a non-dermatologist. From the initial 121 patients identified, 39 met inclusion criteria. And for each of these, we calculated their cumulative methotrexate dose, the treatment duration, as well as a pre and post fibrosis, pre and post treatment fibrosis four score. Based on existing recommendations, we also identified all 12 patients with moderate risk fibrosis four scores and recommended that they receive a fibro scan. So shown are the baseline demographic and clinical characteristics of our study cohort specifically highlighting the hepatotoxic comorbidities and medications. On data analysis overall, we found that there was no association between cumulative methotrexate dose or treatment duration and post-treatment fibrosis 4 score. However, there was an association between the change in fibrosis 4 score over treatment duration with the cumulative methotrexate dose. Additionally, we determined that diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and statin use are independent predictors of higher post-treatment fibrosis four scores. And that's regardless of cumulative methotrexate dose or treatment duration. From the eight patients with moderate risk fibrosis four scores that underwent FibroScan, we found that higher fibrosis four scores were associated with increased liver stiffness. Notably, there were two patients that had no hepatotoxic risk factors and persistently normal LFTs for years who were found to have moderate risk fibrosis four scores and subsequently underwent a fibro scan. On their fibro scan, both of these patients were found to have stage four fibrosis, which immediately led to the discontinuation of their methotrexate. And this is especially important as under previous guidelines, both of these patients would have been continued on their methotrexate without further diagnostic workup, which likely would have resulted in irreversible hepatic injury. So as I mentioned before, 
since we completed our study, new guidelines on the monitoring of hepatotoxicity in patients with psoriasis on methotrexate were released. And I just thought it was especially prudent to mention these as the Fibrosis 4 score and FibroScan are now included in the diagnostic algorithm. So with increased utilization of the Fibrosis 4 scoring system, it's going to be important to correctly interpret its results. So we can see here that patients with low or high risk Fibrosis 4 scores do not require further workup as methotrexate initiation, continuation, or cessation can be aptly addressed with the non-invasive measures alone. However, patients with a moderate risk fibrosis four score do require further workup, and that may include a fibro scan and or a liver biopsy. Following these recommendations is very important as it will avoid unnecessary liver biopsies in many patients in which hepatic fibrosis can be accurately predicted with non-invasive measures alone. In summary, we hope that this study demonstrates that lab values, specifically liver function tests, are often not adequate in monitoring for hepatotoxicity in patients on cumulative, on chronic methotrexate for psoriasis. And using the non-invasive diagnostics of the fibrosis 4 score and the FibroScan are ways that we can easily identify and evaluate these patients at higher risk proving that the combination approach is superior. And I would like to thank everyone who participated in this project, especially Dr. Yim, who helped me prepare this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. That was a great presentation. Thank you. All right. And it would be great to avoid some of those uh, painful liver biopsies for our patients. So. All right, so it doesn't look like there's any questions. So we are going to move on to our final speaker of the night. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Sandra Pena, and she is a PGY2 dermatology resident uh, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And Dr. Pena, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so yes, I am trying to, let's see. Okay. So yes, uh, again, uh, my name is Sandra Pena. I am a first year resident, uh, dermatology resident at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today I'll be talking about uh, the efficacy of topical crisoboral for the treatment of mild to moderate seborrheic dermatitis. I invite you to please uh, look at our conflict of interest page. And so as you all know, seborrheic dermatitis is a chronic inflammatory condition. It's characterized by erythematous, pruritic, flaky patches in areas of high sebum concentration. Um, the etiology is not fully understood, but it's thought to be due to a combination of factors, including malassezia yeast, as well as um, an inflammatory reaction to its metabolites, it is a common condition affecting about 2 to 5% of the population and has been associated with a poor quality of life, especially in female patients and in patients with primarily uh, facial involvement. Current treatment options include topical antifungals, which are really the workhorse for the treatment of seborrheic dermatitis. They're used either as monotherapy or in combination regimens with topical anti-inflammatories. Uh, typically, the topical anti-inflammatories of choice are topical steroids. However, their long-term use is discouraged given their significant side effects, uh, including atrophy, rosacea, acne, and striae. Uh, there was a recent Cochrane review which uh, looked at all of the different treatment options for seborrheic dermatitis, and what they found was just modest clearance rates of about 53% uh, with an associated adverse event rate of about 7%. And so that really led us to consider um, other treatment options that could be of use for patients that are that's not only efficacious, but also safe um, for long-term use. On the face. And so that led us to consider crisoborol. And so crisoborol is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. It's currently approved by the FDA 
for the treatment of mild to moderate atopic dermatitis in pediatric patients. It's an anti-inflammatory that exerts its um, effects via intracellular cyclic AMP levels. And so the purpose of this study was to assess the efficacy and tolerability of topical chrysoboral for facial seborrheic dermatitis. So at UAB, 30 patients with mild to moderate uh, facial seborrheic dermatitis who met inclusion and exclusion criteria were enrolled in an open-labeled investigator-initiated uh, trial in which they were treated for four weeks with chrysoboral 2% ointment twice daily. The primary outcome uh, was an overall reduction in disease severity uh, to clear or, or, or almost clear skin, and that was defined as an investigator static global assessment score of zero or one. Given the impact on quality of life, we also included secondary outcome measures, including an NRS itch score, a skin the Skindex 29, which is the dermatology-specific quality of life form, as well as uh, assessments of cutaneous tolerability. And so just for your review, uh, the investigator static global assessment is a disease severity tool that's been used in prior uh, clinical trials looking at seborrheic dermatitis. Um, the way we uh, derive the score is we initially look at the seborrheic dermatitis grading scale and assign a score of zero to four for the individual components of scaling, erythema, and pruritus. And so a score of uh, zero corresponds to normal skin all the way to a score of four, which corresponds to severe activity. And so we look at the two subjective measures of scaling and erythema, and we average out those individual scores to get us the ISGA. And so after four weeks of treatment, 83% of patients noted a significant um, reduction. They met the primary outcome measure. Um, as you can see in this patient who had a significant reduction in not only his erythema, but also in his scaling. Additionally, there was a two-thirds reduction uh, overall in the ISGA scores, and patients also reported significant improvements uh, in their quality of life, uh, as seen in all three subscales of the Skindex 29. I didn't include it here, but there was also about a 43% reduction in their NRS itch scores, and it was very well tolerated as shown by the cutaneous tolerability uh, scores. We did have three adverse events throughout the span of the study, two of which were considered treatment related, both of which happened in the same patient. The patient reported headaches as well as a burning sensation at the site of application. And so he subsequently withdrew from the study. And so we calculated an adverse event rate of about 2%. And so while this wasn't a head-to-head -head study, um, comparing the clearance rates uh, from the chrysoboral study that we did to the Cochrane review, we noted that chrysoboral was superior, uh, had superior clearance rates of about 83% compared to the current treatments available of 53%. Um, additionally, uh, if I haven't hammered this home yet, it was also very well tolerated um, with an adverse event rate of about 2% compared to the current treatments, which had the 7%. And so um, while this was a, an investigator initiated study, it was a short term study, we still feel confident that chrysoboral is a well tolerated and efficacious alternative to patients who um, have either failed or are intolerant to topical steroids or topical antifungals. And so we'd like to acknowledge Pfizer for their support through this of the study through this fire grant. And those are our references. And that's it. Short and simple. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Pena. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so it doesn't look like there's any questions. So I would just like to thank all of our wonderful speakers. And I'd like, I would also like to thank Dr. Lutgard Beist, who was the co-chair of this first annual uh, virtual Parade of Roses uh, medical education conference put on by the WDS. And a huge thanks to Maggie of the WDS for all of her, all of her hard work uh, organizing and coordinating this program. And um, we are gonna to try to post uh, Samara and Dr. Karosha's uh, slides that we were unable to get, them, get those uh, posted tonight, but we're gonna really try to post those to the WDS website so that everybody can review those.
Okay, thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us and have a great evening.